Good evening, everyone. My name is Patrick Craig, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the National Building Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program. For those of you joining us for the first time, let me just say a few words about the museum. Founded by an act of Congress, the National Building Museum is a private, nonprofit institution that advances the quality of the built environment by educating people about its impact on their lives. We do this through our exhibitions, family, youth, and outreach programs, and through programs such as this one. To stay informed about our programs, check our calendar, become a member, visit our website, nbm.org, and join our online community, including Facebook and Twitter. So our program tonight, DC Builds, Reconnecting the Grid, looks at the plans to deck over the exposed portion of I-395, uh, located just a block east of the museum here, which will uh, reweave Washington DC's F and G Streets Northwest back into the urban fabric. So our panel tonight is gonna discuss the design, planning, engineering, and construction challenges of this project, which is known as Capital Crossing. And when it's all done, which will include 2.2 million square feet of lead, platinum mixed use space, designed by project architects, Kevin Roach, John Dinkaloo and Associates, LLC, and Cohn Peterson Fox Associates. So tonight's DC Builds program is generally, generously sponsored by Asa Abloy. Asa Abloy is the lead sponsor for the museum's exhibition, Kevin Roach, Architect Architecture as Environment, which was on view at the museum from uh, June 16, 2012 to December 2nd, 2012. And it was a great exhibition and we're uh, uh, happy for Asa Abloy's support on that. So you might recall uh, this program was originally scheduled for October 29, 2012, but uh, we had to postpone it due to Hurricane Sandy. So the museum is uh, really grateful for Asa Abloy's continued support, which allowed the program to adjust our schedule and present, uh, present it tonight. So with that, I'm gonna welcome uh, Tom Clullen, Asa Abloy's regional architectural manager to the stage to say a few words. Tom. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate the nice warm introduction and uh, kind of fitting that it is uh, a little bit of rain out there this evening, uh, you know, reminiscent of where we were uh, back when we were displaced uh, a little earlier last October. Uh, thank you to the National Building Museum. This is certainly an amazing venue and uh, we're more than happy and pleased to be part of the ongoing presentations and work that uh, brings such great programs like DC Builds to the, uh, to the museum. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with Asa Abloy. We are uh, the world's largest lock manufacturer. We uh, probably have uh, maybe seen many of our openings, maybe you even specify some of our doors, frames, hardware, uh, electronic locking solutions. And uh, we're globally located uh, uh, you know, here locally for support to the architectural community. And this is, uh, again, just another thank you for uh, allowing us to be part of the, uh, the group to be able to present uh, from the National Building Museum this evening. So thanks so much and uh, enjoy the program. I'll turn the podium back over to Patrick. Thank you. Okay, so for the rest of the program, let me just give you a breakdown of how it's uh, going to work. Our panel tonight is presenting in the following order. First, we're gonna hear from Sean Cahill, then Harriet Chagoning, and then rounded up uh, by uh, Roger Lewis. So each panelist will give a presentation and then reconvene on the stage for a moderated discussion. So I'm gonna give a quick, really brief one sentence bio for all of our panelists, because uh, it's just in the interest of time. Uh, just so you know, we have uh, everyone's bio on our uh, extended bio on the website, so you can check that out after the program. So Sean Cahill is Vice President of Development for Property Group Partners, uh, which is spearheading the Capital Crossing Project, and he oversees development activities in the Washington metropolitan area. Harriet Tregoning is the director of the Washington DC Office of Planning, where she works to make DC a walkable, bikeable, livable, and globally competitive and sustainable city. Roger K. Lewis, FAIA, is a practicing architect and urban planner, a professor emeritus of architecture at the University of Maryland College Park, an author and a journalist. And then last but not least, we have our moderator this evening is uh, Jess Zimbabwe. And Jess is the executive director of the Urban Land Institute's Daniel Rose Center for Public Leadership. So with that, I'm going to turn the uh, program over to Sean, who is gonna do the first presentation. Please welcome Sean Cahill. Thank you. Good evening, how is everyone? I am uh, 
going to give a, a pretty quick uh, presentation this evening of a project that um, we've been working on for a little over uh, seven years. Uh, Property Group Partners, uh, previously was Louis Dreyfus Property Group. Uh, we have actually transformed ourselves uh, into another company through this process, not because of this process, but, uh, uh, but through the time frame that we have been working on it. Um, and actually we've worked with, uh, we're on our third administration here with the District of Columbia. Um, uh, I'm gonna try and, and go through this uh, relatively quickly and, and hopefully we can have some discussion later. The project is known now as Capital Crossing um, and it is uh, located um, about uh, three long blocks from the Capitol, two and a half blocks from Union Station, and obviously uh, about uh, two blocks away from the Verizon Center, um, which is a kind of a heart and soul of uh, uh, the, the, the retail uh, rebirth here in, uh, in Washington, D.C. This is a Northwest Washington address. It stretches from Massachusetts Avenue on the north uh, uh, to E Street uh, to its south. It runs uh, parallel with the three blocks of Georgetown University Law School, uh, which is over on, on the east side here. This is the largest urban law school uh, in uh, North America. There's about uh, 3,500 people on this campus uh, on, a, on a daily basis uh, coming in and out of it. Uh, we like its proximity to, uh, of the site to um, all of the, the courts for both the District of Columbia as well as the federal government. Um, obviously, uh, its, its location to the capital and, and as uh, Harriet will be explaining a little bit tonight, um, we very much like uh, its proximity to Union Station and everything that Union Station has uh, to offer for the city. Um, this is the approved uh, site plan. I'll get into a, a larger uh, photo of it, but we are reconnecting uh, F Street here as well as G Street. Um, the site today looks like this. Um, this is a project of uh, the early to mid-60s where um, running an interstate highway through uh, an urban area seemed like a good idea at the time. This was a, uh, the stop of the uh, highway up until uh, the 70s, and all of these ramps were uh, basically a long-term temporary. Um, just to get you uh, a little orientation, this is Mass Avenue, again, Georgetown University Law School, 2nd Street. There's an off-ramp here um, that is uh, not used at all for the most part. Um, we actually had to ask the district to remove the cars that were parking uh, to take this shot because it's usually filled with, uh, with parking. Um, the on-ramp here is uh, for the southbound. Uh, this is, as you know, probably one of the most challenged intersections uh, in, in the district at 3rd and H Street. Moving along, this is a shot taken uh, from E Street looking north. Um, and you'll see that there are air rights projects that are currently there. This is a uh, um, um, multifamily uh, residential here. This is a, a site that is owned by the District of Columbia. This is an air vent that furnishes air into this north tunnel. And there's, so there's air on this side that is a return. There's an air channel on this side uh, as a return and supply air comes down the center. We are basically taking this cross section and running it down the highway. We are looking to eliminate the on-ramp. We will relocate it uh, in Mass Avenue. I'll show you that uh, in, a, in a later slide. We are taking the off-ramp, which again, takes about 45 to 60 cars a day. Um, and we are gonna, we're gonna get rid of it because again, the, the, the highway uh, starts, the interstate starts just beyond that red brick building. Our plan is also to take the Second Street off ramp, the northbound ramp, and move it directly into Second Street. So they w there will be a portal in a portion of uh, Second Street. When we came uh, to investigate the site, uh, this is Holy Rosary Church. This is a very large, um, very well established Italian Catholic parish. Um, this is, uh, these, if you don't know this parish, you should check into it. it it's a, 
It's a great community parish. Um, most of the parishioners of over 600 come in from Maryland uh, and Virginia um, to participate with this parish. They, have, uh, they give Italian lessons, they, they drink some really great Italian wine, um, and, and they make some very good Italian food. Anyway, when we got there, their annex and their rectory had been moved into F Street, into the right of way of F Street, and we are, we, uh, we are gonna bring them back to uh, the portion of uh, F Street after we, uh, we are trying to reopen it, or we, we will reopen it, so we're gonna bring them back to, uh, to where they were before the highway went in. They were obviously moved because of these ramps. We're gonna bring them back along the new F Street exactly where they were before. This is uh, a location map. I think everybody is pretty familiar with, uh, with what is here in terms of uh, the infrastructure. This is really showing the fact that we've got an infill project here um, in, in Washington, D.C. And I think that um, the, the, the project had been tied up for many years with a previous developer and the District of Columbia who uh, couldn't come to terms um, on either side on, on how to uh, develop the project or how it could be done. This is the approved uh, PUD. Um, this is a 2.2 million square foot project, uh, approximately 1.9 million square feet of uh, commercial office. Uh, the, the overlay for this uh, development, um, even without the highway, was a high density commercial. Um, so we have commercial office buildings on the north block designed by uh, Kevin Roche, John Dinkalil. Um, we have a great relationship with Kevin. He has done a number of buildings for us here uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, 600 Second Street is a residential building of about 180,000 square feet, 150 units, 30 of which, so one-third, are ADU units. We have uh, a, a commercial office building sitting behind uh, the residential piece of about 300,000 feet. Um, this building has not been commissioned yet, um, but we do have a stage one PUD on, on this particular site. All buildings are at 130 feet and measured off of Third Street. The building to the south is a building that is under uh, design by Cone Pedersen Fox out of New York. Uh, SOM has done the uh, urban planning and the overall master plan for the site, and STV is the design and tunnel engineers. What we're showing here is that F Street will be built um, it, it's, uh, for, and will be open for pedestrian and vehicular traffic. The way this works is it's a platform, a bridge, which is G Street, a platform, a bridge, which is F Street, and a platform. There are no federal or district dollars associated with the project. This is all private sector money, and uh, it has been equity um, that has been funding the project for the last uh, seven years. We have to uh, build the entire deck. This is a, a, an axonometric of the, the buildings as they have been approved. We have to build the entire deck. Once we start, we have to do the whole thing. So we can't go and build from Mass Avenue to G Street and build these buildings and then and stop and then take it on again. Um, the deck duration is uh, about four and a half years. Um, if you drive this portion of uh, the I-395, I would suggest that you stay away um, once you see construction start. So what you have here again, looking from Mass Avenue, commercial development, Kevin Roche, residential development, commercial, and the Cone Pedersen Fox. This is the site of the Holy Rosary Church. This is where we have put their annex and their rectory behind. We have created a, a, a raised public piazza behind their buildings. And then we have left a site here um, on the uh, south side of F Street at 3rd for the Jewish Historical Society. So we had the Jewish faith and we had the Catholic faith both having issues on the project. Um, JHS is currently in this area uh, today in a north-south um, uh, orientation, which they don't like. This, was, this is the oldest synagogue in Washington. It had been moved here when the metro building at F and 6th Street was uh, developed. They, plop, they popped them down here on a piece of district land. We are going to move them back in an orientation and on the side of the uh, street that was very similar to where they were 
1968 before uh, they were moved. These are some very uh, quick images of what we have of the Kevin Roche buildings uh, on, up on um, uh, the north portion of the site along Mass Avenue. And we worked very closely with, uh, with Harriet's team. We have High Bay Retail here. Um, this is all somewhere around 18 to 24 feet in height, um, and, and trying to give uh, you know, some vibrance uh, uh, and some amenity to uh, the retailers, as well as getting sustainable retail along Mass Avenue that will hopefully uh, serve the buildings themselves. This is a quick shot looking. This is G Street. So G Street's open uh, for pedestrian only. There is a pedestrian way between the two large buildings. These two large buildings on the north side represent almost a million square feet. Um, and uh, that is a, a, can be a contiguous space uh, of a million square feet. Um, we, we have a very large sustainable package uh, in this development. Uh, that I'll get into in a moment. This is the south building from Cone uh, Pedersen Fox. The, oh, there's an atrium that runs uh, through the entire building, the entire length of the block. This is a 65 foot deep bar um, on the building. So, uh, you know, the light from the atrium uh, to the light of the perimeter wall is extremely good. This is a 90 foot bar. And as I uh, get into these plans a little bit, um, and I'll show you, we think that this is really kind of starting to be the building of the future in terms of what the demand is uh, from uh, the tenants and the amount of daylight uh, uh, that they would want in the building. Very quick shot um, of what is happening underground. The parking runs all along the west side for all three blocks. Underground loading dock for the entire three blocks. And uh, for this entire three block development, we have two curb cuts. So we, we really worked with, uh, with Harriet's office and DDOT uh, to try and minimize the amount of curb cuts and try and make uh, the pedestrian experience uh, that happens up on the grid uh, much safer and much more pleasant. Um, what we did here is we purchased all of this property fee simple. So we own the land under the highway. It's the first time that the federal government um, has done this, or Federal Highways has done this. Um, we'd like to put up some speed cameras here, we'd like to put a toll booth down here, but we've been told that we cannot do that yet. Um, we did have, this was, if uh, earlier in, I showed you a, a, an air tunnel uh, that was coming down from the north. This is that air tunnel, and once we move this ramp out into 2nd Street, this is about a 42 foot depth, uh, 28 feet high. The highway had been depressed 28 feet when it was built to be an air rights uh, development. This is where we'll have all our uh, sustainability. We are working with USGBC uh, on a pilot program for this. Um, we would like to create uh, a tri-gen plant below with uh, natural gas-fired turbines. We'll be mo moving air through the turbines, which we will use in the tunnels. We will take the heat from the turbines for both our residential as well as we will plug in Georgetown's one million square feet of their campus here that is on, um, is on 2nd Street. Uh, and then we will gener generate electricity. And, and, and how, we'll generate the, how much we'll generate is still uh, something that is being studied today. Whether we take these six blocks off the grid, which Pepco says they really don't want, uh, is yet to be seen. We are working with them. Whether we take it off the grid or whether we peak shave is something that we will, we will uh, vet out over the next few months. But we would like for uh, the project to be able to, for a tenant to be able to sign a lease and know what their lease payment is over the 15 year term and also be able to put a harness on what they will spend in energy for those 15 years. And we can uh, hopefully we can talk about that a little bit later uh, in our uh, overall discussions. Um, so we, we have a very large sustainable aspect of what's taking place. We've put that all below grade uh, next to the highway um, to, to service uh, not only our uh, two million feet, but again, Georgetown's. Uh, this is a very quick sec section showing the highway. And so this is an open, um, 
It's just all of this exhaust is just into the atmosphere. Uh, we are going to catch a, a very large percentage of this exhaust as well as all of the exhaust in our parking garage. We will scrub that air through uh, an eco chimney um, and as the air then re-enters the atmosphere at the second floor, um, these eco chimneys are only two stories tall, um, about 85% of the particulates are out of the air. So the air has less particulate uh, in it than, than the air that we are currently breathing when we walk the sidewalk today. Um, and this is a section of how the buildings will sit over uh, the highway. So uh, what's important to note here, is this is the parking that I showed you before and all of the service, but what's important to note is that the, the deck, the platforms don't hold anything but curbs, gutters, uh, uh, lawn furnishings, landscaping. All of the structure comes down through the deck and down to terra firma. Now there will be areas where we've got some transfers that uh, need to take place and we've got, uh, we've got great architects and engineers that are, are working with us uh, now, but the, but the point is it's built like any other building in Washington, D.C. Federal Highways is asking for, some, uh, for, for us to beef up what takes place down the center of their uh, highway separating the north and the southbound lanes. Um, so in fact, these portions of the building will be more robust than most office buildings here in Washington, D.C. This is a uh, sample of the floor plan of one of the north buildings. Again, relatively small floor plates, um, and we will have panels. Um, I don't think that uh, Zavon knows this yet, but we want, we'd like to have knockout panels here uh, in, in particularly deep areas of the building that we would be able to take out to allow light in um, if, if the tenant were uh, wanting to put a large uh, atria in, in the building, especially on the top floors. And then this gets into uh, the building that Cone Pedersen Fox is doing for us. And again, I think that this, for, this is a one block long building. This is 340 linear feet of building. Um, and the way that this is worked out with the atrium and putting the elevators and vertical transportation in the atrium, where these will all be glass elevators, is that you have, a, you have a relatively shallow span. You have an opportunity to have a great space uh, not that far from the perimeter. Even, even the one that's 92 feet here is not so bad. This, this only goes up uh, for about uh, six and a half or seven stories. So uh, to, to end it, um, we are, it, it's been a very aggressive project. We've been working on it for over seven years. Again, this is all uh, private equity that is, that is making this engine run. And um, to be uh, relocating uh, infrastructure uh, within about a six block area on the street grid later this year, uh, September, August, September, uh, on infrastructure. We'd like to be commencing with the deck in the second quarter of 14. We currently have about $25 million in motion. And what I mean by that is that we have all of the engineers, all of the architects in motion doing all of the work for uh, the uh, federal highways, the highway facility itself, the street grid, the platforms, the bridges, the infrastructure, and the buildings. And with that, I'll turn it over to Maria Tregoni. Um, really happy to be here and really happy to follow Sean. I'm going to give a little bit of context uh, about this project um, and, uh, and about what else is happening in the city. Um, I'm going to start out by saying, you know, as all of you uh, in the audience know, that we, uh, we're a very fortunate city. We're a very well-planned city. Uh, we have a great tradition of planning, and we have one of the most famous plans uh, in the entire world, and that's the L'Enfant Plan. And that has given us a remarkable city of gridded streets, uh, wonderful diagonal boulevards, uh, fantastic squares uh, and circles throughout the city. And, uh, you know, it's a plan that I think is very rightly revered. Um, but we also um, have been, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're a city for a U.S. city of, of some antiquity. And, uh, uh, you know, 
that is not the only plan, the L'Enfant Plan, that has guided the development of the city. Uh, the Macmillan Plan in, in 1902 uh, really was about uh, re-envisioning uh, the, the, the mall area, and that really required relocating a lot of pesky infrastructure. Uh, some of you might know that, uh, that our original train station was actually on the mall. And, uh, and in order to realize uh, some of, the, uh, of these planning visions, we had to move a lot of stuff around. Sean mentioned that uh, um, uh, the poor uh, Jewish Historical Society has, uh, is, uh, is moving again. Uh, and that that is, uh, you know, that is kind of the way that it is in cities, that uh, you know, over, over time cities are mutable and things can move around. Sean also mentioned that uh, one of the real features of um, uh, you know, of the 20th century, the mid-20th century in particular, was the amount of transportation-related incursion um, that was, I, I guess today we might even say inflicted on the city, and that uh, we broke uh, a lot of the, of the L'Enfant grid, uh, the, uh, the, the L'Enfant plan, uh, with, with, those, uh, with those incursions. And that one of the great things about, uh, about the 21st century is that we are actually doing a lot of work throughout the city to kind of do, uh, uh, to reconnect the city, to, uh, to build over, to repair, to restore the connectivity that has been disrupted by some of that, uh, uh, by some of those activities. Uh, I'm gonna talk about three projects very, very briefly. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the Union Station project and that uh, that tangle of tracks that, uh, uh, that's behind Union Station and what that kind of has done to uh, the connectivity of, of neighborhoods there. I'm going to mention just very briefly uh, a southwest neighborhood uh, where, the, where the beautiful Maryland Avenue uh, is no longer continuous and what opportunities there might be to reconnect that. And then I'll, and then I'll come back uh, to Sean's project very briefly and talk a little bit more about that. Um, the Union Station Air Rights Project uh, it was pretty significant when we started talking about doing it. Congress is the one who basically uh, uh, required those air rights to be sold. Um, but I think many of you know that now uh, Amtrak has a master plan for Union Station that envisions tripling uh, the capacity of the station in terms of boardings. And so it also now envisions that uh, Union Station would become a facility that's almost three blocks long. So it would be a much larger station, it would have a lot more capacity, and there'd be a lot more ways to enter and exit the station. Uh, I think some of you have probably had uh, the ignominious experience, I guess I would call it that, of, uh, of, of coming, uh, coming to Union Station from 8th Street and having to make your way through the garage to get to Amtrak. I mean, it's really pretty horrible. You know, pretty horrible. So imagine, you know, having uh, a half a dozen ways to enter the Union Station, uh, many of them uh, as gracious as, as coming through that wonderful Beaux-Arts uh, Burnham Design Building. So the, uh, this is an air rights project that in some ways is not unlike what Sean is talking about uh, in that the transportation facility is not going to go away, it's not going to be relocated, and it's not going to stop operating. So building uh, while that train uh, activity is going on is, is, is what the, the challenge really is. Um, it's an, it's a, uh, designed explicitly to connect the neighborhoods on either side. We now have this burgeoning uh, Noma neighborhood that's, that's up here that's, that's growing uh, by leaps and bounds. But we also have the wonderful uh, Capitol Hill uh, fabric of historic row houses um, on, on the other side of Union Station uh, that, that's also very important to connect. Uh, this went through a very extensive public process to establish zoning, um, and what was also done was, um, uh, was to, the Zoning Commission required a, a, a design review and approval process for each building and each public space uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, that, the, that what was realized was, uh, uh, was the best that it could possibly be. So it's quite a large project now. Uh, at least one uh, 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 whole floor of the project is going to have to be residential, one FAR out of the total. Um, and there, there, I expect that there will be some revisiting of the plan. There's now some discussion that the parking garage might go away. And with the master plan uh, for uh, Union Station, 
overall for Amtrak. The, the preliminary design of the station is, uh, is very, very different. How many of you have been to the St. Pancras station in, in London? So um, I, I think that was very much the model for what they want to do here. They want a very uh, glassy, uh, daylit uh, terminal uh, that, that's very, very convenient for users with lots of ways in and out. Uh, and where um, the actual activity of the trains arriving and departing is kind of the theater that you get to see from every part of the building and not this kind of underground experience and not this kind of, um, uh, right now we have so much storage of cars here, of trains, that sometimes you're, you're boarding back here. Uh, and it's, it, again, not a very gracious experience, not a very efficient experience. I mean, if you were going to store trains, would this be the real estate you'd pick to do it if you had some other choice? Um, a, and a lot of the growth, a lot of the boardings are actually Am, uh, not Amtrak, but they're Mark and VRE. And those commuter rail services, uh, a lot of people get on at our most crowded station, which is, uh, which is here, uh, the red line at Union Station, only to try to get over to uh, a, a a different line to get over to L'Enfant Plaza so people can access orange and blue or green and yellow. So if we had run through service, for example, to uh, L'Enfant Plaza, that might make a lot of sense. So we're looking at a lot of things. But the biggest issue is that uh, while we love the train station, we love the convenience of being able to access most of the northeast quarter by train, the, the set of tracks has really made it impossible for these neighborhoods to be connected. So, you know, this is another example of a, of a really significant uh, restoration and re-knitting of a, of a very important neighborhood, and we're delighted that the project is moving forward. Maryland Avenue Southwest is a little bit of a different thing. This is one of our um, federal enclaves, our federal office-only enclaves virtually, um, and and here the infrastructure is the uh, is 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 freight um, traffic. This is the CSX tracks, and it 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 uh, you know part of its construction and the the and the building of this part of Southwest, what GSA is now calling Federal Center South or Federal Triangle South, is. Um, is many, many different levels of infrastructure, so much that to the pedestrian, even sometimes to the, to the driver, it's almost illegible. It's very difficult to know how to get from point A to point B because there are so many different levels, so many different ramps. And so, um, and, and, and this is a place that, uh, uh, that really has an opportunity uh, to, to bridge over in several locations, to deck over, uh, to, to deal with that track intrusion, and potentially also provide the opportunity for a much expanded um, L'Enfant Plaza station uh, with additional ability to handle uh, commuter rail. Let me see if I have some other pictures. Um, there are, um, uh, the, the proposal is really to try to uh, make this deck uh, pretty continuous along Maryland Avenue. And, and this is the identification of parcels that could potentially be developed. This is an example of the open space and connectivity. And all of these connections would be new connections that don't, that don't currently exist. Now this is a project that unfortunately um, uh, doesn't have as much development opportunity uh, as some of the other projects. And so the, the, uh, the thought is that the, uh, that the public sector might need to uh, invest more to be able to make this happen. Uh, but it's the kind of thing that, uh, that, that we are contemplating, um, absolutely. Um, I don't have uh, the, 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 the wonderful new uh, uh, name, Capital Crossing, for this project. We, we, in the office, we call it the I-395 Air Rides Project. But um, uh, you'll, you'll recognize it from, from Sean's pictures. Um, all I really want to say about it is that you know, this is, um, you know, one of the most obvious and egregious uh, transportation intrusions, um, you know, in the city. And it really does cut off, um, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, east-west. It cuts off the eastern part of the city and, is, and you know, has uh, kind of stopped the development of downtown, if you will, uh, you know, right, right here. And so reestablishing uh, the, the lawn font grid, um, F Street, G Street, um, uh, bridging over and basically, you know, uh, making it so f to any pedestrian, anyone who encounters this project, it's just going to seem like the absolute continuation of the fabric of the city, and, and it should be, uh, it should be tremendous. 
Um, you know, Sean mentioned he's on his third administration, but I think only his second planning director. But um, uh, so we've been at this a while, and it's an incredibly complex project. And I have to give uh, I have to give um, uh, Sean and his team a lot of credit because it's. Uh, um, many of the things that they're trying to do in this project have never been done in the city. Um, arguably, they've never been done anywhere. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that is hard, that is hard slogging. But I think the, the you know, the result is, is really, really worth it. Um, it's a lot of development that's going to be on the site, but it's all, you know, it's also going to be incredibly green. And one of the things about doing a project at this scale, I mean, it would be very hard to acquire this much land. Um, in, a, in a different sort of a project to be able to do three whole blocks. He mentioned some of the green features. A lot of them don't make any sense to do for a specific building. But because he has so many buildings and it's a, you know, it's really a district that he's creating that, so he didn't talk a lot about stormwater, but uh, you know, that's a huge problem in the city. The project is designed to collect an enormous amount of stormwater and, and he's figured out ways to reuse that stormwater um, as part of the, the uh, the, the cooling system for, uh, for the site to be able to generate energy and, and to be able to make it available beyond the borders of the site you know, is, is very, very exciting. And so there are many, many features that are really innovative and terrific about it um, that, uh, uh, that I don't think any other project in the city is, is, is doing. So I think uh, you know, full advantage has been taken of those opportunities. Uh, Sean already mentioned one of the things that we really uh, like about the project. Um, the more that we become a city where people take transit, walk, and bike, um, you know, the, the, the more conflict we see in some ways uh, between the infrastructure that we'd created for automobiles. I mean, the highway is, is one example of that. But there are, uh, in most buildings, a ton of curb cuts. Uh, for, for the number of buildings that are contemplated in this development, there would easily be 12 or more curb cuts associated with them, but there are two in this project, and all of the loading is going to be taking place underground, uh, and they've really consolidated a lot of those services, and that is a, uh, his is not the only project to do this, but he's doing it on a scale that uh, we haven't seen in the city. More and more projects are trying to consolidate loading and to do it underground and to eliminate the curb cuts and give the pedestrian the priority uh, that, that the pedestrian needs and deserves. And so uh, that is one of my favorite things about this project, that all of that is going to be taking place out of sight, underground, and, and you're going to have continuous sidewalk um, and, and, and not have to worry about, uh, about that. Um, I guess the, the final thing I'll say about it is that despite the complexity of this project, um, and it is an incredibly complex one, um, uh, I, I would call it a real work of civic repair. Uh, and restoration. I mean, uh, you know, the the even in front of the zoning commission, everyone recognized that this is an absolute good for the city to re knit uh, the fabric of the city back, and that and that only development could do that because of the immense cost. Um, I will say something else about the cost that Sean did not say. Despite how incredibly complicated this is, uh, what he has told me is that building the, the, the deck, constructing it the way they're constructing it, is actually less expensive than buying the equivalent real estate downtown. So for those of you out there who have equity partners, we have other air rights possibilities in the city. You know, if it's going to be cheaper to build it than to, uh, than to buy the land, I think that uh, we might be seeing more of these uh, ahead of us. So with that, thank you. I'm setting this up for Roger. Roger wanted to come. I, it seems, I feel that Sean, uh, Sean's presentation and Harriet's presentation really covered the territory. So I'm just going to make a few uh, gratuitous comments and, uh, about uh, what this means for uh, reconnecting the city. Uh, and uh, maybe I should begin by uh, uh, reminding those of you who may not know, I, I've been writing for 28 years a column in the Washington Post called Shaping the City. And uh, in fact, it probably should be called uh, reshaping as well as shaping the city and perhaps even uh, undoing some misshaping that's gone on. Uh, and I think as, as uh, Harriet and Sean pointed out, uh, we, like many cities, have this legacy of, of interventions, particularly for infrastructure, that, uh, in, that seemed like a good idea at the time, but which uh, today are 
uh, are clearly things that uh, cause problems. I, I want to interject a little bit of history. Uh, we should be mindful of the fact that, that we're, not, we're not really the first to, to take on such projects. I think some of you know that, uh, for example, the city of Boston uh, undertook the big dig, the uh, bearing of the central artery uh, decking over uh, at, a, um, at a quite uh, enormous uh, price tag. I think it, I, I've heard different numbers. That was somewhere in the 14 to $16 billion uh, arena uh, to get that done. Um, uh, there's still controversy over what should be done on top of the deck. I imagine that uh, if Harriet, Sean, and I probably would agree that uh, they decided to make it essentially all park space. I, I, that was probably a mistake. Uh, uh, I think probably some amount of open space was appropriate, but I, I think they missed an opportunity to build on top of that. You probably know that San Francisco tore down its Embarcadero Freeway some years ago along the waterfront. Uh, you, some of you may know that uh, Seattle is planning to do something similar. Uh, there are, uh, there are, I think there have been for really several decades uh, many Americans uh, in cities, in, including Washington, that recognized that we did some things uh, that maybe weren't a good idea. Um, I always told my students at the University of Maryland that the only theory in design, urban planning, and architecture that doesn't ever go uh, out of date is the one that it says it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, I think doing uh, urban makeovers uh, uh, also is, is something that goes back even uh, before uh, what we would call modern times. I mean, I, I remember uh, the number of places that we have visited in, uh, on the planet uh, where uh, the tourist information talked about how uh, one regime after another uh, repositioned the defensive walls or uh, rechanneled uh, actually uh, the movement of water. I mean, it, this is, this, in other words, what, what I think Sean's company is doing uh, what the city is promoting here is uh, part of a long history of makeovers, of reshaping cities. Uh, I, I think this scheme, I want to talk a little bit about the scheme, the design. Being, since I'm an architect, I, I naturally look at it and wonder what I have done it the same way. Uh, the answer is yes. I think that the, uh, the fundamental uh, concept here in plan and section, the massing, uh, the strategy for dealing with... Uh, uh, all of the issues that they have to deal with, utilities and circulation of vehicles and loading, et cetera, uh, it, it seems almost inevitable when I look at it. I think it's, uh, so I want to just uh, give you uh, and your team uh, very high marks for uh, this scheme. And of course, I, I have to give uh, uh, the city high marks for making it happen. I, I, I want to underscore something Sean mentioned uh, t briefly in passing, uh, and Harry alluded to it, and and uh, I heard it once before when I heard him make a presentation. Uh, they've, they've spent seven years just getting the entitlements, just getting the, the okay to do this. And uh, having uh, designed a lot of projects and also uh, in my earlier years when I was a lot thinner and had considerably more hair, I actually did real estate development as well as running my architectural uh, operation. Uh, it, it's to stick around for seven years to be able to do that financially um, to have the energy and the commitment to do that is in itself uh, worth uh, uh, a lead rating. I don't, you know, I don't know whether lead is giving ratings for that, but uh, it's it's worthy of that. Uh, I think there's I think there's a future here we haven't quite uh, fully seen. Uh, some of you may know there's a streetcar line being built line being being built along H Street. Uh, what you may not know is there's actually a master plan for a network of streetcar lines. And uh, uh, I'm, I don't remember it uh, as well as I probably should. Harry could talk about it. But um, uh, the streetcar network, in fact, uh, isn't just going to ultimately be along 8th Street. It's going to be uh, a number of lines that I believe uh, will uh, do a tremendous amount for the city uh, even, and, 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 in fact, over the long run through the value it brings to the city, particularly real estate value and business, uh, <coughs> excuse me, business value uh, will pay for itself. There are people who are skeptical of that, by the way, so I, if any of you are here, maybe we can talk about that later. Uh, I have to, uh, I have to uh, say one thing that probably, uh, probably the only thing in the scheme, Sean, that I might have reservations about uh, are, are some of the glass skins on the buildings. Um, 
I, 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 when, I sit, when I first saw the Kevin Roach design buildings, and Kevin Roach is a, is a, very, is a fabulous architect uh, and has done many great buildings, not the least of which is the, uh, and probably the, one of the best is the Ford Foundation building in New York. Some of you may know that building. Um, uh, I, I, I think they need more work. I'm just going to be, you know, I think that the building, uh, I, I, I understand why the geometry of the buildings is the way they are, but I'd love to, it seems to me that the, that the f facades are not quite as enriched as they might be, and I have no problem with the, the use of the material, the glass, but I'd like to see the glass skins on that very large building uh, uh, enhanced a bit, uh, and, and you, you probably have, have heard that before. The, um, the only other thing I would like to add here, uh, and this is uh, probably going to embarrass my wife, my, my wife went to Georgetown Law School, uh, and uh, she used to, uh, this, was, this was back in the 70s, when you could park, there was a ramp that had been built, an access ramp, you probably know this, on the uh, east side of that cut that wasn't used. And uh, it was actually a parking lot for people who attended or taught at Georgetown Law School. Uh, I, am, uh, I, I suspect that if she were here, she would be, uh, uh, if she were up here, she's in the audience, uh, she would probably agree that this, what you're about to do here, is going to be a great improvement. Finally, uh, the, the, the L'Enfant plan, uh, Harriet really said it, she, she took, my, took my words. Uh, th this plan really is one of the great uh, city plans uh, on planet Earth. And I think uh, the notion of knitting it back together, of making these connections, and the connections are, are, are not ju just streets uh, and for, for automobiles and bicyclists and people walking and strollers, et cetera. But the whole idea, for example, of connecting to Georgetown Law School, now that I've mentioned law school, of, of talking to them about uh, sharing energy or even collecting stormwater. I know there's another project or two that I've uh, I've, I know about where that's where, where the developers, the property owners, are actually making deals with adjacent properties to connect. There are lots of ways to connect, and I think it's fabulous that you are doing what you're doing there. Um, I, th I think uh, we, we talk in real estate about highest and best use. Uh, that's what this project, I believe, is aspiring to achieve. Thank you. Let me sit here. Go up. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is where you want me to Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you all for your presentations. This is uh, obviously a fascinating project, and uh, we're fortunate to have so many different perspectives on it uh, for the discussion tonight. I'd like to start, I guess, by talking about the public private partnership um, that made this project possible. And we talked a little bit about the entitlements and how challenging those were. And Sean, you mentioned that you've been involved for at least seven years, uh, three mayoral administrations, but only two planning directors. Um, and so there's a, a couple different levels that you're working on public-private partnerships too, because you're working with the highway administration on questions about the air rights. But more specifically, in your partnership with the city, going through that entitlements process and what lessons can we take from this project when we're looking at other major complex, mixed-use, large-site projects in downtown, projects like City Center, the redevelopment of Walter Reed. Uh, if you, maybe you could start us off, Sean, and then we can go to Harriet and Roger. Well, I, I think that um, for, for the city, and, and I think that the city has been fortunate um, in the past that it, it's got great projects uh, that, are, that are under planning or under development. Um, City Center was a fantastic site, um, but it took it six and a half years to get to get going. Um, and um, part of that is market driven. Uh, part of that is an in, in entitlement and and how you bring the project about. But I, the, the thing that I, I believe that is most important for the city is to be able to help cultivate uh, the developers who have the staying power to do it. And that, that's not all about uh, who has the most money. That has to do about who has the passion uh, to take an idea, um, create a vision, um, establish uh, the working relationships with the, uh, the city planners, 
private planners and engineers uh, and be able to work through uh, the, uh, all of the different aspects. Uh, you know, we had 2008 happen to us, uh, October of 2008, which was really right smack in the middle of this project. And we had to make an, a, a huge adjustment. You know, that, when we started this project, it was going to be a, a lease of the air rights. And uh, we went back to Federal Highways and said, this is not going to work anymore. We'll never be able to borrow money uh, to help uh, to build this infrastructure uh, without owning it. We have to own it fee simple. And that took a long time for them to get their head around it. They did, um, and uh, eventually. And then being able to work with, with DDOT and, and Harriet's office, it, it, for me, it's about staying power and it's about uh, having the right partnership. And, and it's not a financial partnership, it's really the partnership of picking the right horse uh, to, to, to move these things forward. Mm -hmm. I would certainly never say that we, uh, we, we make the process arduous in order to winnow out, you know, the, the developers who were not up to it. But uh, if you look across the landscape of real estate development in this country, there's a whole bunch of people in the business who do what, what they call themselves blow and go, right? They throw up this development and they are out of here. And they try to turn it around as quickly as possible. Speed is of the essence in part because they're trying to beat the, the, the next downturn that comes from overbuilding in their market and get out. Um, you know, but, but we are not that, we're not that place. Uh, we're the opposite of that. Uh, the, the, the developers who specialize in urban um, are, they have to be a different breed. By its very nature, it's more complicated to build. It is, um, it is uh, a, a, what, what people would describe as having high barriers to entry. You know, you can't come here from, uh, you know, from Irvine, Texas and expect that you can know your way around and be able to navigate, you know, the different approvals, the different agencies, you know, all the different things that you have to do. But when you talk about a partnership, um, you know, I think the city um, has its end to hold up. Mm -hmm. so, what we have is a scarce resource in the city, not a lot of land, not a lot of development, not a lot of height, uh, which in some ways gives certainty to developers about the, the, their, the, the, the relative scarcity of office space, housing, whatever it might be in the city, so that they can have some confidence that there's not gonna be a lot of crazy overbuilding and there's not gonna be, um, uh, that, that there's likely to be uh, pretty steady demand for the thing that they, that they provide. Uh, our part of the bargain is also to make sure that, uh, to the extent we can, that this is a marvelous city to live in, uh, that there are lots of transportation choices, that the quality of the public realm is pretty good, that we continue to attract jobs to the city and diversify the economy, that we make it possible, uh, that we make our neighborhoods great and convenient and, and a pleasure to live in, and more and more neighborhoods are that way, so that more and more people will, will come here. And I would say, um, the cost of doing any one of those things is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what we try to bring to the table in the city. Sean said that, that not a bit of city money went into this project, no federal money went into this project. Um, and I think that's appropriate um, because our part of, of the bargain is to try to uh, make and maintain a really great city, a really great place that will be uh, a, a place of enduring value. And that's what he needs to have in order to make this kind of investment. If you thought the next administration would reverse the policies and, and turn things around or, or uh, have radically different development ideas, well, that wouldn't be a place where you'd have certainty. So anyway, I kind of went on too long. But, but in, in a public-private sense, that's what I think the city brings to the table. That's why we don't like to offer financial incentives, because the thing that we do, it's very, it's very difficult for any other jurisdiction in our region or anywhere else to offer those things that, we are, that we've become good at. Roger, do you have anything to add about the nature of that relationship and what might be learned from a, a, a long, challenging process like what's gone through at Capitol Crossing? Well, let me, let me uh, footnote what Harriet just said. Yeah. I, I've been in, I came to Washington in 1967, so I've been here long enough to see how much the city has changed, uh, uh, which is, uh, not only it's, has it changed a lot, but over the last 20 years, the last 20 to 25 years, the improvements in the quality of this city, the livability of the city, 
the physical environment of the city uh, has, has, has really accelerated. I, uh, I think uh, at some time in the last year or two on, on uh, the radio, on the Kojo Namdi show, we talked about the fact that, uh, or I, I made the prediction that I think Washington will become even more attractive as a city to live in and to do business as many of these kinds of projects and others get realized. Uh, I, I, there's no question that it has a lot to do with the, uh, the attitude, the, will, the philosophy, and the, the willingness of the city and people in the city to, in fact, um, make these things happen and, and, and to enable them. Um, and I say that in part because I have been at times, uh, there have been some times in the city when I, I, I used to do some projects in Washington uh, where getting a permit, for example, compared to Baltimore, where I also did work, or compared to Houston, Texas, my hometown, was a nightmare. It was, you know, uh, uh, you all remember on the, the permit department on H Street, that dreadful building, uh, um, going through there, uh, getting a permit used to be a hassle. And I had clients doing projects in Virginia and Maryland who wouldn't do work in the city just because they found it was an ordeal. Uh, I think those days are happily behind us. We're going to take questions from the audience in just a moment. Um, so I think there are some building museum staff with roving microphones. If you've got a question, get it ready. Um, but I'd like to ask the panel one more question before we do. And Roger, maybe you could start us off. You've offered some historical perspective on some of these big visionary um, plans for in Washington and other cities. Uh, you might rename your column reshaping some misshapens of the city. Or um, we seem to be, I mean, some of the examples that you mentioned of other cities that have taken down freeways or covered over freeways are in some ways anomalies, right? The Embarcadero Freeway in San Francisco actually came down by an earthquake, and so yeah, the city didn't make helped. the ultimate decision, right, to take that down. Uh, the big dig in Boston was certainly an anomaly of federal funding going into the support of that project. So I guess what I'm wondering is we seem to be in an era where the public sector's role in those kind of large visionary projects, rather than implementing carte blanche, an idea like Harriet's example about Maryland Avenue, she mentioned the challenge of not having too much development potential in the sites around there. Is the best role now in, in the foreseeable future for the public sector to sort of set the table for a private investment to come in and undo some of those misdeeds on our urban fabric? Well, I think, that's, I think that's the, the dominant ethos of the moment, but I'd be the first to say one size fitting all is, not, is never appropriate. I mean, I think every, uh, every city is different in most jurisdictions of most public sector uh, agencies to limit what they put on the table financially. Um, but, you know, but there are also other mechanisms that didn't exist. I mean, there's TIF, uh, tax incentive financing. Uh, there, are, uh, there, there are things that cities or, or states can do uh, other than pulling money out of, a, out of their annual budget mm -hmm. to help make things happen. I, I think the, uh, and Sean would back this up, I think the other thing is there, you know, nothing's going to happen unless the developer, if we're talking about private investment, and we're talking about income producing real estate, mm -hmm. Nothing's going to happen unless, one see, unless there's market, mm -hmm. unless there's demand down the road that, that can be counted on. I think Harriet alluded to this. Mm -hmm. as, so that, that's, that's always a, a big part of the equation. Uh, you know, whatever I build, will they come? Can I sell it or lease it? And, and can I do it on, in a time frame that, that, may, that bo makes the bottom line mm -hmm. uh, feasible? Mm -hmm. That's great. Sean, do you have anything to add about the, the role of the private sector in some of, some of these civic restoration? I think that was Harriet's phrase. For this well, I, I think that they are, um, I think that's the projects that you've seen tonight and the projects that you will see in the next uh, two to, to 15 years here in Washington. There are some major uh, development opportunities that are available, <clears throat> but they, are, will, they will be density driven. Mm -hmm. And the Air Rights uh, Capital Crossing is a density driven project and, and, and Harriet, uh, made a very good point. You know, one, one of the reasons that we did this is that um, we helped the district get out of uh, a very bad situation with a previous developer uh, with the land. So we, we came in and, and helped resolve what was a stagnated uh, position on both sides, really. Um, but we were able to work with uh, economic development people uh, in the city who were very bright. Um, and very energetic and very uh, able to think uh, out of the box 
of what, what you would usually look at on a, on a, a terra firma site. And um, uh, we're, we're able to, uh, to help us along uh, and stand side by side with us with Federal Highway. So, you know, we had DDOT uh, with us and we had economic development and we, we had our PUDs. We had our PUD uh, for this project before we owned it. Um, so, you know, we, we had the, the envelope of the zoning um, and that was very important. And there, you know, that doesn't usually happen in, in terms of um, going through a zoning process where you have to have D, DDOT opine on the project, but at the same time they're, they're in a role with the federal government. So, you know, how do they do that? Where's the balance? And I think that the city, you know, rose to the occasion on, on a lot of fronts. Did they do it as quickly as I would have liked them to? No. But, but they did it. We've got a great project and, and you know, we, we're, we're moving <coughs> forward. So I think that that, that would be my addition. Well, I just think that, um, you know, we're in better financial shape than so many other jurisdictions. <coughs> um, you know, we're putting money into our streetcar system. We're building, uh, rebuilding schools and libraries. <coughs> um, you know, we, we, we're, so many places are, are, are much, much worse off. But I think every city, including ours, is really looking at, you know, some of the big things that need to happen that would make our city even better you know, even more fiscally stable, even more uh, wonderful and convenient to live in, there's a big lift associated with those things. And, uh, you know, we're a city that, that doesn't have a lot of debt capacity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, almost half of our land is not even on the tax rolls. Mm -hmm. You know, we're limited in height. We have, we have limited abilities uh, to do these things. And so trying to figure out ways in which, uh, given all of our limitations, we can, um, you know, do this kind of big, important project. Um, you know, I think that's a, you know, that's a really uh, wonderful and interesting challenge to have. And I think there are a number of other opportunities in the city, but, you know, we are, we're landlocked, uh, you know, they're not infinite. And, and I think a lot of us feel, you know, the weight of that responsibility uh, to not create a project that has misshapen the city, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the view of, uh, you know, of future generations, but actually have done something that, that, uh, that was an absolute positive for, for the future. Mm -hmm. Jess, there's, there's one other point I, if I could make yeah, to, to, that we ought to make that we haven't focused on at all, which is we, we should not lose sight of the fact that there are people and places in this city, um, and I'm thinking of Ward 7 and 8, I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of the affordable housing challenge, I'm thinking of some other challenges that are really uh, outside, if you will, the realm of this project, but uh, uh, you know, th this project will be a market rate project. This will not, uh, this will be, uh, I, I think you've got some below uh, AMI mm -hmm. units in there, but uh, th these are, these are f this project and the other ones I know about are adding a fairly minuscule percentage to the inventory, let's say, of affordable housing that this, this city and other cities need. This is a problem, uh, this, this is a national problem. I mean, I'm just, uh, uh, in that sense, Washington is not unique at all, but, but certainly there are, uh, particularly across the Anacostia River, but even in a few other neighborhoods, there are some things we have yet to figure out how to, how to deal with in a way that uh, reduces poverty, that reduces, uh, uh, improves education and so forth. I, I don't want to change the subject, right. but no, we I shouldn't lose sight of the fact that that's part of the project. That's right. Of, of making a city. I think that's a great observation when we're talking about market-driven approaches to redevelopment because that's going to be one that's going to be challenged, uh, a big challenge to approach in a market-driven way. So I think that's a great observation. Uh, how about some questions from you folks? Uh, I admit that I'm challenged to see we, we that far see. the audience, so don't be shy about physically demonstrating your questions. Right. So folks, please, if you have a question, please raise your hand one and I will here, bring then, the uh, yeah. microphone to you. And please speak into the mic. We all want to hear your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are a few projects that are currently underway of this scale. I can think of three other ones. There's, a, there's the city center, there's the Southeast Federal Center, uh, there's the H Street uh, project. Can you compare what you are doing, Sean, and how the city is uh, reacting to these uh, projects in ways that are different from each other? 
Uh, some of them started before you were involved in the in this. What did you learn? What what have you? Le is there something you've learned from uh, their experiences, and how will those experiences be translated into, oh, you know, Walter Reed or the McMillan Reservoir or Poplar Point or whenever those uh, developments come on? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, it's a it's a question that that uh, you know we could obviously all sit up here and probably debate for a, a while. I think, I think City Center was a project that came online, you know, uh, in, in, its, in terms of what the big idea was. Uh, eight or ten years ago, that was 2002, when that RFP was out and, and everybody was kind of chopping it. 2003. Into the, 2003. Um, so, you know, it's, it's 2013 and they, there's no occupancy yet. It's a little bit different in that um, it, it did not take advantage, in my opinion. I think it's a great development. I think it's a great re-knit. I think it, it, it hits a lot of the market, uh, um, re, uh, what the market is asking for in terms of more housing and retail than there is commercial. It didn't hit a level of sustainability uh, for the opportunity that I think it has. You know, that, that's a metro center, right? City-centric um, city center is its name, right? I mean, it's, it's so, and it didn't take uh, full advantage uh, as, uh, as I think it, it could. What I believe is, um, is taking place on some of these projects, and again, you know, I'm going to come off of Capital Crossing because we have invested a great deal of time, effort, engineering, um, and, and thought in t to how to, how to do that um, and how to get somebody like USGBC to recognize it. Um, and I hope that what that does, our hope is that it separates the, the, the project from other projects in the city. Our real hope is that it separates Washington, D.C. from other cities in that it, it will be so sustainable, uh, both on the water side, uh, which I really didn't get into uh, in, in much detail, but and the energy side and the air side, that people are going to start to really rethink how they do this. And we had an opportunity with a strip of land that was underground next to the highway, not really marketable. What do you do with it? You try and use it. It's an opportunity to separate your project to become something different. And I believe that as people look at these large projects and Walter Reed and, and, and uh, what, what's coming our way, uh, they, they will recognize those opportunities. They're not, they're not always easy to recognize. New York can do it because they've got height. We've got 130 feet. We, we just, we're not going to give up FAR to put in a cogen plant. Um, and cogen plants need uh, access because that machinery has to come in and out. Um, and so, you know, having large graded openings in the public way are probably not something that Harriet and DDOT are going to approve, and we wouldn't want it either, quite frankly. Um, so we had an opportunity. I think people will start to see the evolution of how this takes place and the technologies that are available to, as part of the design. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I, I'm, I'm smiling because I just love hearing you say that uh, you're, the, the market distinction that you hope to make is to have the most amazingly green and sustainable project. You know, I think, I think that says, it, says a lot of things about our city and about the kind of race to the top that we are, are engaged in. Uh, and it wasn't always that way. So, you know, I love hearing that. But I think it was a great question. And I could name several things that both projects have in common um, I wouldn't call this formulaic, but I would say that, that we have identified certain elements uh, to successful neighborhoods. Let's call them neighborhoods because it's the scale at which we're doing work in, uh, in Noma, in, you know, at the southwest waterfront, at the yards, um, you know, at, at, uh, at Walter Reed. That's kind of a neighborhood scale. Sean's working at a neighborhood scale. That, um, that the projects are mixed use, so that you have activity at different times of the day, you know, so you don't end up having a, a, a place where uh, your retail can't survive because no one's there 
uh, you know, after five o'clock. Um, that the places are served by transit, and in some cases extremely well served by transit. They might have other ways to get around, but that transit connection is very important. Uh, amenities uh, as part of the project, built into the project, that provide uh, real convenience for people to make it easy to live there. Um, a lot of these projects have restoration elements. You know, city center is bringing back two streets you know, that were obliterated by the old convention center. So we're, we're you know, in, in a lot of these projects, we're either bringing back the gridded network of streets that had been previously destroyed, or we're extending a street grid where no one ever existed before. So there's gonna be a lot more connectivity, a lot more ways to access the site. In some cases, amazing public realm, new parks, new features, new access to the waterfront, you know, all kinds of things that, that, that really distinguish the projects and make them amazing. Um, and, uh, and a lot of them, um, have really terrific sustainability features. We passed the most stringent green building law in 2006 uh, here in Washington. Uh, Boston adopted a very similar law right after ours. Uh, but I'm, I, I'm so amazed by our, our development community. Technically, most of them were not required to comply with, uh, with the green building law until January of last year, just about a year ago, January of 2012. We had nine green buildings in 2006. We had you know, we had almost 300 projects by January of 2012. Before, most of them were required to comply, and they only ever had to be LEED certified. More than half were gold and platinum buildings. So they went way beyond what was required and, and way sooner than what was required. And, uh, and, and now they compete with each other based on who has the most sustainable project. I love that. Do you want to add anything to that question? No, I think. There was another uh, just here on the aisle, and then take a couple more. Good evening, and I, I work at the Georgetown University Law Center, and um, there's obviously many aspects of this project that are tremendously beneficial for our community, and we really appreciate that. I do have a concern about traffic, and you were describing in a very general way the, uh, the exit ramp onto 2nd Street, uh, and also F Street is going to be opened up, which is legal and appropriate, but there F Street is going to go through the middle of a campus that, as you say, have 3,500 people who are walking back and forth all day. And I wondered what uh, is going to occur in terms of uh, pedestrian safety and traffic mitigation. During, uh, actually, we just met with uh, Wally today. W Wally's uh, in, on, in on our team meetings on a weekly basis. We've been meeting uh, with Georgetown. Um, not only uh, the law school representatives, but with Georgetown University about every 45 days for the last seven years because personally, I think Georgetown should buy the site. That's just my opinion. <laughs> but it seems to me that they're branded there. They could take seven acres off of their West End campus, put it onto this campus. It seems to have a lot of synergy. Site a hospital. They could. It's a good idea. <laughs> um, so there, we, we have, uh, during the construction, there, today, let's, let's start with today. Today it's a very uncomfortable walk. East Street is a very uncomfortable walk across that uh, chasm. Uh, Mass Avenue is a little bit better, but not by much. There is going to be a four-year period where that whole area I would, I would call it six blocks. So I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to realign 8th Street, bring it back to the La Font plan. We're going to open up 3rd Street. Uh, that little cut through the park that you have to get on is going to go away. Um, we're going to reconnect all that. So I'm, well, there's about six blocks here. It, it's going to be tough. We're, we're going to keep uh, the grid open on 2nd Street for Georgetown University. We're working, again, very closely uh, with, with Wally and, and Kevin uh, in, in how to do that, what to do for your daycare. Um, you, you've got a daycare center, you've got kids, uh, children out there. Um, do we relocate that or do we screen them uh, somehow? You know, so there are a lot of aspects uh, and a lot of things that we will uh, need to address. During the construction, it's going to be construction in an urban area. There's no way around it. And, you know, that's kind of the price that that you pay to, to bring these, these, uh, these things along. When it's done, I think that it is remarkably be better than what you have today. We don't need F Street to go through 
uh, to New Jersey Avenue or to First Street. It doesn't do anything traffic-wise to our project, and it, that's really kind of a, a wanky intersection anyway Once, if you were to go through uh, and bring F Street all the way through. And um, the pedestrian experience here, I think, at the end of the, of the project is going to be enormously better uh, than what you have today because of the remitting. Let me. Yeah, it's something, and then we'll take a question over Let here. me add something to that. Uh, just a general, a general principle, if you will. Uh, one of the wonderful things about the L'Enfant Plan and about uh, all city plans, which essentially uh, are based on a block, a street block pattern that's a lattice or a grid that, uh, and and the, and where the the size, the proportions of blocks uh, are reasonable. Uh, this is about connectivity. Is that is that it? It really is in the interest of ameliorating and enhancing uh, movement, mobility, mm -hmm. to have the most complete and connected grid that you can have. Um, you know, one extra, if you go to Portland, Oregon, the blocks are 200 by 200. I mean, the density of the grid is extremely high. Uh, you know, if you're at point A, there may be 18 ways to get to point B, as opposed to uh, some places I've been in suburban Washington, where if I'm at point A, I have one way to get to point B, if there's one blockage, uh, the system collapses, fails. So one of the beauties of the L'Enfant Plan and, and of what uh, we're talking about tonight, of, of reconnecting, restoring uh, connectivity, is that it actually enhances uh, the, 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 whole, the whole mobility enterprise. And one other point is this is connected to density. I mean, the density, I want to underscore what's already been said by my colleagues. Uh, this is also a plan. The L'Enfant plan uh, is an enabler of density. This, you know, by having this kind of pattern, uh, we, we can uh, build 130-foot high buildings. And in my opinion, there are certain places in the city where we can go higher, as you all know. Uh, but I think this is one of the beauties of, of the plan of Washington. It actually enables the creation of a project like Capital Crossing without compromising, uh, in fact, mobility. Thank you. Um, actually, the last comment is sort of was touching on what my question was be, so I'm going to try to change my question around a little bit. But if I wanted to, so it's, it's actually on pedestrian connectivity, street activation. And so first I wanted to ask if Sean could comment um, specifically on which paths, pedestrian paths, that you foresee, you predict, or you want to happen that don't exist now that might occur in the future. And that the second part of it then is actually probably more theoretical um, for the planning director, for Harriet. But um, from my perspective, um, and this isn't necessarily a criticism, but more of a, of a question uh, that I, that's always running through my mind um, about how to activate spaces. Of course, it's, it, you, on one hand, you need to have um, connections that didn't occur otherwise, but previously. So for instance, where we are now, um, you can walk right now already to Union Station, but most people probably wouldn't do that. But you would, wouldn't think twice about doing that in Manhattan, the same distance, and how we intuit the distance for various reasons. And a lot of it has to do with active frontage, frontage and, and, a lot, and that goes back to retail. So, that, that, so this is the, so that I think this, the first part of the question is a specific example of that for the project and outside of our site. And the second actually, is more broadly, can we actually um, expect Manhattan style? I mean, we need the densities, but so that you can actually link whole neighborhoods, that people will make the, the decisions to walk these distances. I mean, is, will we ever, ever have enough retail right. to enable that to process to occur? Sean on the project and then Harriet. Okay, on, on the project itself, I, I, the, the reconnection of F Street it, it cannot be underestimated. When you walk out of Union Station and you look to the west, you are looking down F Street. And if we can get Holy Rosary, the annex, and the rectory out of the right-of-way, which is what we plan to do, you will be able to see a vista to the Treasury, Treasury. Building. Yeah. So, you know, that's, we're talking over 15 or 16 blocks, and this is not a vista that is, oh, maybe you'll see a piece of it. You're going to see the Treasury Building. 
Uh, F Street is on a plateau. It's relatively flat. Um, this building sits off of the F Street right of, right of way a, a, a fair amount. Um, and I, I, I think that when you see those vistas, that is an invitation to take the walk. You'll be walking through a green area, which is, which is the Georgetown Quad. I, I guess that's the, the best way to put it. Their G Street, they also own that piece of G Street, um, uh, Fee Simple. That is also a tree-lined uh, walkway. Third Street no, will no longer have an entry portal uh, in it for the highway. So, so Third Street now is 110 feet wide. Um, it's a, so it, it's a major cartway of the Lafont plan in terms of its width. Um, and will be a very inviting street in terms of having residential to one side of it, the east side of it, um, and the, and the, uh, the commercial, uh, which will be ours on, on, uh, there on the west side, uh, residential. The east side will be more the commercial. So I believe that the, the re knitting of F and G uh, changed the game for how people will access the east end to Capitol Hill. I believe that G Street will be the pedestrian way uh, because there are no cars and they can cross over um, the highway now uh, without actually ever seeing it. Um, F Street becomes more of a vehicular way uh, up, to its, uh, uh, up to the second street to the Georgetown University Law School campus. But, but you know, I, I would say that tucking that highway away um, such that it's really not there anymore. It is, but you, you, you don't see it like you do today. Creating the vistas, um, and that is where we've lined our retail. Um, and a lot of that was, was driven by, by uh, the planning office on, on the size, uh, on its shape. Harriet likes tall retail for some reason. We, we tend to not like real tall re retail as a developer. Um, but those are the things that give it opportunity uh, to live. In terms of, I, I would respond before I hand it off to, to Harriet, that the issue that we have with Washington with retail is density driven. We do not have the density. If you're in New York or if you're in Boston or if you're in Seattle, when they empty out for lunch and, and a, a million and a half square feet in one building is emptying out onto the street for lunch, that's density. That drives retail. We don't have that. I don't think we'll ever have it to that, uh, to that magnitude. Um, but we have opportunities to bring in retail that thinks about it differently than what we all know it to be. I have so much I could say about this. And we had so many conversations about this. Very lively discussions about the retail and about how important um, the, the, the how important it was that that we activate the fronts of the buildings and that we activate the streets. I do agree with Sean that that we don't have the density to have retail on each and every face of every building. We can't support it, but we still need street activating uses. We need to have observation. We need to have eyes on those streets for safety purposes. And that, and that in many ways, you know, we're not used to thinking about it this way, but we could be punching above our weight. We have 40, 400,000 people who come to Washington every day to work. We have 17 million visitors a year. We could have a lot more retail than we currently have. It's not just our 630,000 uh, people who could be shopping here. Um, so. I, th I think there's a lot that could happen to change that perception about retail, but it's still not going to be every block face of every place. You have to pick the streets where you're, where you're going to have activity, both, both for retail purposes and where you need that safety. So our biggest discussion was about Massachusetts Avenue, mm -hmm. you know, uh, which is not the most lovely and delightful walk right now. And there are lots of places where Massachusetts doesn't have any continuous building frontage. So that retail, if you were going to have it, would be very intermittent. You know? So what are the ways in which you know, we can enliven that street, remake those places, and, 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 and have uh, the possibility of having double-sided, decent retail? So 
you know, that remains a challenge that we have to work with. But I think that's a very important question and a real important part of how we are thinking about buildings all the time uh, when we look at what we can do and what we can redo right. and repair. You know, in a lot of places, this was all by our own devising. We, we allowed too many garage entrances. We allowed too many dead lobbies, you know, where there's nothing going on inside the lobby. Uh, we allowed the entrances to be not on the main street. So, you know, those are the kinds of things that we are, that we are working to fix throughout the city. For one more question, and this gentleman's been trying to engage for a while, so let's give, perfect, thanks. A <laughs> uh, very quick uh, note, I'm on the board of the Jewish Historical Society. The uh, stifled collective gasp you hear is the entire board holding its breath when uh, our synagogue, having already been moved once when it was almost 100 years old, is going to be moved a second time when it's 140 years old. But um, the important point I just wanted to note is that in addition to moving the synagogue, we will now have next to it a building for a Jewish museum which really doesn't exist right now in Washington. The Holocaust Museum, remarkable as it is, doesn't serve that purpose. So after we breathe a sigh of relief when the synagogue is moved, we're going to have an important addition to the cultural life of the district. That's great. And, and you have the structural engineer who 40 years ago designed the relocation of the building from F Street. Sitting here in the audience, we have, uh, we have retained him yet again to move it to move it for its final resting space. Mm -hmm. so, so if we could just have the, uh, the panel, if, if there's anything more to add to that, but if we just have the panel really quickly do, do some closing thoughts, just yeah. real briefly. Roger, do you want to start? Oh, I'll be last. OK. It's not required, um, but just. I, well, I, I would just say that, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, this project is an example of the kind of, uh, of, of of development project that I hope will typify what we uh, we do in the city uh, into the future, uh, both you know extremely uh, wonderful environmental features, but also really uh, doing a civic good, uh, re knitting uh, the the Lafont streets back together, increasing connectivity, making it a much better pedestrian experience, and bringing activity to a part of the city that. Uh, that really suffers from, uh, you know, from not having things going on there in many parts of the day. So I think, uh, it, it, you know, it's been a pleasure to to be part of this panel to talk about those those parts of the project. I would say that it, it's been. I'm born and raised Washingtonian, and uh, so I've been here all of my life, other than a couple of years where I, I did actually go down to Houston, um, your hometown. Um, and learned a lot, um, but but the important thing uh, that I would say in closing is that, uh, as I mentioned before, staying power um, and 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 having the passion and the dedication to stay with the idea is important. The other thing that's important is is to basically use the resources that we have here. Um, you know, we have used, we do have Kevin Roche on the on the project and we, you, we do have uh, Cohn, Pedersen, Fox on the projects and they, they're out of town uh, architects. But we, you know, SOM, uh, their Washington office has been with us for seven years. Uh, uh, Bill Browning of Terrapin Bright Green, uh, Tadger Cohen architect, uh, structural engineer, the MEPers, MEP engineers, uh, STV, uh, a local tunnel engineering design firm, using the resources that are here for us are as important uh, for doing a development that, that is in the city um, and, and working for something that is the, the community and the region. That's great. The only thing I would add is, is I understand that work might begin this year. Um, and I, th I think it's great that this is finally uh, going to happen. I think this project will, in fact, be a catalyst. I think that just as I think the the wharfs project, some of you may know at the Southwest Waterfront, uh, that they, uh, I think almost all their entitlements are in hand. Uh, that's going to be a transformative project for uh, the Washington Waterfront. Long overdue, I think uh, this project will do the same. I thought C Harriet's uh, showing several other projects, and, and 
if we had a, if we're running an all-day seminar, she probably could have put 20 circles up on that, uh, on the map of Washington. I, th I think there's just a tremendous amount going on in this city that is going to fulfill my prediction on the radio some months back that, that uh, Washington is, is going to become really one of the most vibrant and, uh, and desirable places to live on the, on the continent. And on behalf of the panelists and Asa Abloy and the Building Museum and their DC Build series, you, know, you folks had a lot of other things you could have been doing tonight. So thank you for caring so much about this conversation in this community to come out. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>